Now, to session one, which is titled War and Wealth. It will focus on the age of imperialism and empires to examine how and when Singapore became a maritime hub for global flows of trade, resources, and wealth. The two speakers on this panel are Professor Peter Frankopan, who is Professor of Global History at Worcester College in the University of Oxford, and Associate Professor Peter Boschberg, who is at the Department of History in the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences at NUS. Here to introduce the topic and moderate the session is Professor Danny Kwa, who is Dean and Li Ka Shing Professor in Economics at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, which is part of NUS. Thank you very much, MC, and welcome everyone to the first session of this Singapore Bicentennial Conference organized by IPS. This first session has been titled War and Wealth, and it reflects a duality with which my two interlocutors will be approaching discussion of the matter at hand. What is the matter at hand? Hardly, this is an occasion to reflect on the 200 year history of Singapore since Raffles' arrival. This is partly a story about the ongoing development of the Singaporean people's identity and values, and the acknowledgement of Singapore's strategic position in Southeast Asia. The duality is that on the other side of that, today, all of us are also painfully aware of the US-China trade conflict and the possibilities for a potential bifurcation in world order on 5G, potentially many other technologies, if not the entire world's trading system. Contest between great powers, incipient change in the international rules-based order. Now for some of us, these are exciting times to live through, to witness, to get to be part of. But a great economist once said that large-scale socioeconomic experiments like this one are best observed from a distance. <laughs> Those of us who are in the throes of this will need to suffer the consequences. In place of this full-scale natural experiment then, from the perspective of scholarship and understanding, the best alternative that we've got is to turn to history. And it is exactly that that my interlocutors will be bringing out for us. On the one hand, we will be hearing about the rise and fall of great powers, change in international order, the historical emergence of different regional orders of a previous era. Set against that will be the story of Singapore's own historical emergence diplomatically, politically. The second part of this story, this first part that I've just described, is a story about grand politics. The other part of the story is a story of grand economics. So we will hear these historical perspectives on the development of international trade generally, but also the importance and significance of trade routes in particular both land and sea. For many of us today, thinking about international trade means thinking about trade agreements, thinking about the software that we write to enable trade. But trade, the exciting part of trade, was always also about building the hardware, the trade routes, the land and sea, and hubs along the way. So what impact have these developments had on kingdoms and empires? How do these historical lessons reflect on today's implications for Singapore as a trading hub and Singapore's relevance going into the 21st century in Singapore's diplomatic ties and in global economic competition? As the two interlocutors tell their story, those of us who get to listen to them will also have opportunity to reflect on 
the role of luck and fortune and large global dynamics, what the role of agency is of specific individuals or groups in nudging along the evolution of world order. When was there progress and when regress? Okay. It's time for me now to hand over to the two presenters. Let me say a few words about them because you already have their bios before they come up to make their presentation. On my right, Professor Peter Frankopan, Professor of Global History at Worcester College at the University of Oxford. Among academics, he is viewed as a specialist in the history of 11th century Byzantine Empire, history of Asia Minor, the Balkans, and Russia. But more generally and more accurately, he is viewed as a rock star among academics. <laughs> His work has been about the history of change over centuries in the global economy. From the perspective of Asia and the East, interestingly, rather than more conventionally when it comes to thinking about the world from the perspective of the West. On my left is Singapore's very own Peter Borschberg from the Department of History here at the National University of Singapore. He is a leading scholar on the early modern history of Singapore and the region with particular focus on trade and so in historical Europe-Asia engagement and therefore, in the field known as international history, diplomacy and international relations in historical perspective. The way that we're gonna proceed is, I'm gonna hand over to the interlocutors to speak for each for 25 minutes. And then after that, you will notice that there are microphones all scattered all around this room. After that, we will have a question and answer session. Rather than your waiting for me to recognize you when you put up your hand, I urge you to just go line up at one of the microphones as soon as possible, and then we will proceed with the Q&A session. It remains for me to invite you to welcome Peter Frankopan to the podium. Thank you very much, Professor Kwan. Thank you for inviting me for this uh, very auspicious celebration. It's wonderful to have so many people coming to hear about history. Um, and of course, uh, it's not just the 200th birthday, the 700th birthday too, to commemorate as well. It's a particular pleasure for me. My wife's mother was born in Singapore, so I'm hopeful that one day my children could play some kind of sport for your country if, if selected. Um, I'm going to do a whistle-stop tour. I've only got 24 minutes and 30 seconds left uh, to talk about some of the big themes in history. I'd be delighted with questions at the end. Uh, when we think about the past and we think about connections, often uh, land routes get all of the glory, crossing deserts, crossing mountains, and so on. And that's very obvious, I suppose, in the name of the old Silk Road, one of the most famous networks of the past that connected China with Europe. Or at least that's the story. In fact, nobody went from China to Europe, and almost nobody went from Europe to China, apart from Marco Polo, who maybe didn't get there, and Ibn Battuta from North Africa. The way we think about the world, about connections, is very hard to visualize. It's very hard to imagine how people travel, and we always use the extremities to think how people move around. But in fact, when we think about how um, we interact on a day-to-day -day basis, certainly before the, air, uh, the age of air travel, most of our connections are most intensive with the people who live closest to us. So these words and labels like the Silk Roads are complicated. They conjure up ideas about caravans and expensive fabrics, elite goods that are expensive and used only by the few rather than the nitty gritty of day-to-day -day exchange. Now when it comes to the oceans and to the maritime connections that we have, these are perhaps more important uh, than uh, connections by land because people are allowed and able to go further which is why uh, the island of Madagascar has a language that is derived from Malay. And 96% of the population of Madagascar has mitochondrial DNA connecting the people and the population to the peninsula of what's now Malaysia and this region, Southeast Asia. And that's because you can go further over the water and you can stay there. One of the challenges thinking about the maritime routes is you are dependent on geography. Uh, you need to rely on the winds to take you in one direction and winds to take you back in the other. The winds and the climate uh, are what shape 
the global past because not only do the winds bring rains with them, but they dictate not only when you can leave, but how long you stay where you are because you can't come back straight away unless you go against the wind and against the currents. That means that maritime cities and cities along coasts tend to be cosmopolitan because they are attracting people from different areas, different cities, different places, but also when they get there, they're often forced to stay for longer, which allows for an intensification of exchange, not just for trade, but in term, terms of religion, in terms of language, in terms of culture. So the way in which the seas connect people together and then act as barriers when you can't go against them are extremely important in thinking about the past here, a map of the connections between Madagascar and Malaysia. So even 2,000 years ago, one can talk about a, a form of globalization where there are um, goods and information being passed across, not just from east to west, the traditional European way that we only imagine goods coming eastwards and never ask what comes in the other direction, but a map behind me uh, is a very nice uh, approximation of the information being gathered both in Rome and in China 2,000 years ago that list the things that matter, the sort of things that people ask today. Who has money? Who can buy things? Who has things to sell? What are fair prices? And how we connect together. So we find even maps more than 1,000 years old, uh, this, is, this is based on the, the map of Ptolemy, that describe, in this case, the Malaysian Peninsula, uh, the Malay Peninsula, rather, uh, to, uh, to explain how people moved and traveled, what mattered to them. And we find these global networks that we find easy references in marine archaeology. So we find amphora and pots and pans and images found in shipwrecks. This one, a Chinese, jade dra a Chinese dragon found uh, in the Gulf of, um, in, the, in the Arabian Gulf. And we find this, I think, a, an important way to understand how people were connected to the point that in northern India uh, uh, 2,000 years ago, people used coins that were designed to look, feel, weigh, and have the same value as coinage in Rome because the intensive trades mainly carried out by sea because, of course, overseas you are able to carry much more. And above all, you are able to avoid customs posts. That makes sea traffic cheaper in the long run. That's important for today, too. Uh, in in uh, Southeast Asia, we see the scale of trade between cities, between states, extremely intensive so that single wrecks like the famous Belitung wreck uh, was carrying uh, tens if not hundreds of thousands of pieces of, uh, of ceramics from China. Uh, goods find their way to markets when they're unimpeded and above all when there is security, which is one reason why we find the arise, rise of states across Southeast Asia that are doing more than just providing justice and law for their citizens, but finding ways to interact. And those exchanges, as I mentioned, are not just about um, they're not just about goods and commerce, they're also the way in which um, religions in particular spread. Uh, we can think about that particularly in this region with the idea of, of Islam spreading in the 15 and 1600s, that when people move and they travel, they bring the kinds of questions and answers that are important to them. How do people run their states? What happens to us when we die? Uh, what are the important ways in which we can cooperate or compete with each other? And those exchanges are very important, I think, to be functioning together. So across Southeast Asia, we find images of the Buddha to protect seafarers uh, in multiple locations all across South and Southeast Asia, where Buddhism, Hinduism, and later Christianity, uh, local religions, um, uh, and Islam jostle and compete and borrow from each other to form ways of providing common languages. Sometimes we think only in terms of difference. Those things that unite us and our similarities are much more interesting, particularly when you look at the history of the seas. So when we look at this region in particular, we see in the, um, in the early Middle Ages, states like the Chola and the Srivijaya empires, loose confederations that are doing multiple things, also in association in competition with themselves. Above all, to block out piracy, the single biggest challenge to, uh, to trade, opportunistic attempts to take out cargoes and to, to harass sea traffic, and one of the things that these empires do extremely well is to consolidate power in the form of the semi-divine ruler. And that's something which is very important and interesting in the case of the foundation story of Singapore itself. We have accounts from, in, written in Chinese and multiple languages talking about the prosperity of individual cities and the way in which um, those who are able to benefit from trade can make great fortunes. One of my favorite accounts 
um, a, a governor in what's now, what, what's now northern Vietnam, uh, talking about the fact that he'd made so much money from trade and from um, the tra traffic coming to his city that he had not only thousands of slaves, but the, the most beautiful ones, the women, he um, made them put fragrances in their mouths so that when they laughed and smiled and sang, the room smelt better. I think you can't do that these days, quite rightly so. But the competitive space in which we are looking at this map behind me is extremely important to understand that when you are successful, you generate competition. And that competition, when things go well for you, are your Trump, Trump, I don't like using the word Trump at the moment, but are your competitive advantage, but they're also your strategic weakness because your success allows people to replicate and in the worst case, uh, provides a moving target uh, for, your, for unwelcome attentions. And that's more or less what happened when Singapore was, uh, was first founded in 1299 or there or thereabouts. The Malay Annals, the oldest uh, written source for this region, talking about the prosperity and the size of the city that then follows, is part of a story where uh, Palembang and then Singapore and then Malacca are finding new locations to do very similar things, dictated by trying to stay away from welcome or unwelcome attentions. Uh, when we think about exchange, uh, it's important to talk also about how we bring other unwanted byproducts. One of the things I'd like to talk about in the, in the discussion might be about disease, because when we get on airplanes, get on ships, we take things with us, and those overland routes uh, were the prime vector of the spread of the Black Death, not only across Asia and across Central Asia and the Middle East and Europe, almost certainly here into Southeast Asia too, but very little work. Uh, been done about this is something which is brand new for scholars to work on. What's interesting is, is that the success of really big empires that are, that are stable are that they are contiguous. They are land, land masses where you expand by adding territory that is approximate to your own. So the great Mongol Empire, uh, built by the descendants of Genghis Khan in the 13th century, or the Ottoman Empire at its peak here in 1566, or the Safavid Empire. This is what empires tend to look like. Uh, states that are successful expand and they bring other regions under their remit. That changes very dramatically and is revolutionized by the European experience after 1492 when Columbus sailed across the Atlantic. Europe didn't have the kind of wealth that Asia did, either in terms of demographics or in terms of its resources. All of the things that were interesting for the elites in Europe, like silver and gold above all, diamonds, emeralds, all kinds of jewels, but also spices for medicine and for to, to allow ta your food to taste good. Uh, uh, these were all products that came and commodities that came only from east of what's now Constantinople, Istanbul. And Europe specialized in something else uh, rather, than in, rather than looking towards stability and empire building. It specialized in violence. Uh, the European countries were invested their energies into developing technologies that allowed them to dominate each other militarily. That's why our history in Europe is very closely linked to that of, of continuous warfare. And to give us a sense of that scale, between 1350 and 1950, there wasn't a single decade that didn't involve a war between European powers. When we th often played out, in, not, not in Europe, but around the world, uh, that, that pressure to keep on in innovating, to keep on uh, in investigating new ways of doing things, of course, are why the Europeans became formidable castle builders, but it's also how they became um, uh, specialists at developing larger scale technologies to conquer those big oceans. So whereas uh, maritime technology across the Arabian Gulf, across the Indian Ocean and Southeast Asia don't show enormous amounts of change, there are some exceptions, that have, the, the expensive and big expeditions of Zheng He that I'm sure we'll talk about, but to conquer the Atlantic and the waves and the oceans also around the southern coast of Southern Africa that, went, that took place in the same decade in the 1490s gave Europe a competitive advantage to not only bring back goods in larger volumes, but gave them the, the military ability to be able to defend, protect, and promote their own interests. That is the story of the expansion of European empires to the point that when we really can talk properly about globalization in terms of the Americas too, it just so happened that Europe, through, through coincidence, uh, is in the middle of the map, more or less. Uh, and that gave an advantage in terms of being able to root resources, commodities taken from the Americas, particularly from the Aztec and post-Inca worlds, uh, and to use those products in the, and, and the resources first to uh, make wealthy, 
the states in Europe itself, but then to start building staging posts in places like Manila to allow um, silver to be routed across the Pacific to go to the places where that money could be best spent. And the things that people wanted to buy were, of course, uh, ceramics and silks and spices and the commodities that were available in other parts of the world and not in Europe. And very unusually, uh, the European model of empire was one in which um, expansion didn't take place through contiguous, through the, through the movement of borders through, um, by additional spaces. The Europeans, when they landed in Bengal, when they came to Southeast Asia, the first thing they did was to build reinforcements and to, and to fortify their locations, having taken a great deal of effort, like here the Dutch, the great map makers of the early modern period, uh, to, to, to make sure that they knew what was where uh, and where was the most profit. And locations like New Rotterdam in Makassar in, in Indonesia uh, or in Bengal took locals by surprise because before when traders arrived, they needed protection, they needed support from uh, rulers far away, but it hadn't happened before that people from thousands of miles away uh, would fortify and enforce and use their leverage eventually as they got bigger and bigger muscles to dominate and to become involved in local affairs. So that story, and I'll show just two of these empires, the Spanish Empire, which primarily went to the west, and eventually the British Empire here, colored in, in red um, after, the, after the, um, the, the independence of the United States, was a story of how to build an empire ultimately connected by maritime links. Until the middle of the 20th century, it was possible to go from one side of the globe to the other on a British ship without leaving British-controlled ports. You would sail to Gibraltar around the southern tip of Africa and onwards in a series of well-thought-out, well-planned maritime silk roads, for use of a better word. That strategic vision of what did you want to get hold of, how did you protect it, and how did you then use that position uh, of advantage to expand your remit was something that's extremely important and very interesting. Of course, that, mean that, you, that meant that you have two competing ideas. So when um, uh, the pirate Thomas Raffles uh, later to Stamford Raffles, uh, came to think of uh, a new fortification in, in Singapore. The primary story was about how to displace the Dutch monopoly. But at the same time, the advocacy of free trade as the primary purpose sits at odds because what, what Raffles wanted was to have a better opportunity for British traders. As we all know, competition is what brings prices down and produces efficiencies. Um, but there are, I think, these two very different ideas about what free trade means and to whom. So the Dutch, for example, talked about the freedom of the seas, meaning the Dutch freedom of the seas from their interpretations. Free trade looks good as long as you're the one who controls and benefits from it. So this is one of the reasons why Singapore became so successful, by en enabling higher levels of competition than had previously existed. That displacement of the Dutch, as the Dutch had displaced the Portuguese, uh, before them. Now, how does this connect to today's world? Well, one can see any, any, any number of echoes uh, in the historical narrative amongst things we see today. One of those is the growth of Asian economies in the whole. Uh, the rate of growth since the 1990s, there are many and complex explanations for this uh, that the economists here will be able to talk about with more authority than me. Uh, but primarily driven by the liberalization of China on the one hand and the end of the Cold War on the other, has led to an acceleration in, of rapid growth, above all in Southeast Asia. And we see the blue chart of the G7, the West countries, in 1990, uh, how that has been changed until 2014. And the assumption amongst most economists is that the, the emerging seven, uh, the states that are growing with large numbers of population sizes, capital at their disposal, uh, acceleration of their infrastructure investments and professionalization of their civil services means not that the West is shrinking, but in real terms, uh, other countries are becoming more and more successful. One can see that through anecdotal evidence of how cities are being built uh, or in terms of GDP. And I just show uh, China's GDP uh, acceleration here in a very clear, uh, in a clear graph. Uh, this dictates decisions that have been made across almost every single sector. Professor Kwa mentioned the digital and the 5G and the cyber challenges that uh, we face in every state in today's world. But uh, Facebook's own, um, uh, own statistics show that it sees its entire future and its prosperity and profits to be based on whether it gets things right in Asia Pacific. Uh, 
Likewise, the story about the great divergence, that moment where Europe accelerated and got away from the rest of the world through empire building has clearly gone into reverse as the Asian century is not about to begin as the Financial Times says, but has begun and I think quite some time ago. Um, here in the ASEAN states, of course, although uh, we can locate the states together in one group, that hides all sorts of discrepancies and differences between the individual countries and of course within those states too. So we see just in simple terms uh, the per capita income in Singapore relative to other states within this region. There's no comparison whatsoever. The accidents of geography doesn't explain anything. So classing these countries together as ASEAN states uh, is also problematic. Likewise, seeing that the, the pace of real GDP growth, which has been profound across the ASEAN states, is not being uniform. It's not the same for every single state, partly because there are different factors, geographic, climatic, demographic, economic, and of course, political too, that explain some of these things. But the move of, uh, of, of states in Asia towards higher levels of innovation, uh, for example, here by patent applications, which over the course of 10 years, the blue space is is Asia on these two charts, it is dramatic. The investment into education, into science and technology, into, making, in, into trying to understand the world that's changing around us rather than what we seem to be doing in, uh, in the Western world. It's very telling that Donald Trump's slogan is make America not make America great, it's make America great again. In Britain, it's about taking back control. It's about a reversion towards perhaps golden and more happy times. And of course, you can measure the success in all sorts of different ways. The, the pressures of infrastructure that are placed, for example, on, on Singapore in the last, not just in the last 200 years, but above all in the last 20 years in terms of the demographics, the size of populations, when you are prosperous and you thrive, that attracts people to come and trade, to come and live. And that has unforeseen uh, consequences and then some very foreseen consequences, such as the pressure on housing, on food, on cost of living, etc., etc. Um, I'll t round off with a few words about China and the Belt and Road because I think this is something which you will want to talk about. Um, but in 2013, President Xi Jinping in, in Astana, the capital of Kazakhstan, announced that this was a time for the countries of Asia to cooperate in the way that they had done in the past successfully through the ideas of the Silk Roads. And as a historian, I'm as interested in the idea about a reference to an ancient trading network being used in the 21st century as I am to ideas about why America can or should be great again. The idea about what exactly those Silk Roads are, what exactly the Belt and Road Initiative is, I'm not going to go into now, but I'm sure we will talk about. But the, the idea of a series of massive investment projects, perhaps connected to each other uh, with a master plan, perhaps it's more ad hoc than that, has a very important uh, emphasis on the maritime connections. Uh, individual investments have gone uh, not according to plan in places like Sri Lanka that we'll talk about at Hambantota, but the idea of looking at how to build networks that that facilitate China's long-term growth and also have an accelerative process on other states too is, of course, of direct and specific significance here in Singapore. Uh, of course, here also for Singapore, the, um, one of the challenges is that uh, although the Straits of Malacca uh, control a vast proportion of the trade coming, moving between the Indian Ocean into the South China Sea and beyond, uh, China is also investing in providing options. Some of those include um, overland routes. There are famous examples of train traffic that now brings trains from Yi Wu in uh, on, the, on the eastern coast of China, the Pacific coast of China, to London directly, um, or to Tehran, or in fact even into Armenia. Um, but there are also plans uh, that are well developed to develop a port called Gwadar in Pakistan to allow a new port that will be under, under Chinese control for the next 50 years that will allow China to have the option and the ability to route traffic closer to markets into the Middle East. So there is a strategic plan that is not just dependent on costs and on price and on competition, but also on what China assumes and thinks its long-term future is. The port of Gwadar, which became operational, deep water port operational, very soon after the deal was signed, is growing extremely quickly at the moment. China is betting on uh, Asian and African future. This chart behind me from Our World in Data, a big project we run in Oxford, uh, shows that by 2100, 80% of the world's population will live in Asia and in Africa. That means the mouths to feed, the telephones to sell, the fridges to make, uh, the education to have, the kinds of languages, literatures, music that we're going to listen to will be shaped not by that small minority that will become 
uh, will need to compete harder and harder to stay involved, but there is an entire logic to seeing how local connections uh, can intensify. This takes us back to those periods of 1,000 and 2,000 years ago where local prosperity is good for the, uh, for the whole, whole wider regions. Uh, as I mentioned, we have a different, uh, a different uh, projection of what we think the future might evolve in the United States, but one of those is a, is a profound anxiety about exactly what is going on in the Indo-Pacific or Asia-Pacific uh, region. These, these are very sensitive labels right now for what's being uh, talked about in Washington. But the language we started, we started to get uh, two or three years ago that's got much stronger under the Trump administration has been in terms of China seeking to overturn um, the global order and even to displace the United States. Uh, this speaks, I think, a lot about uh, the United States' own ideas about history, but clearly the signs of what lies ahead uh, need to be understood, which is, I'm sure, one of the reasons I'm here. The projections of what that global, um, the, the effect on global trade will be, JP Morgan produced a report at the end of last month that said that already Trump's tariffs add $1,000 to, to the cost of every single household in the United States. And um, here we see some projections about what will happen to global GDP and the pressures uh, on a fairly substantial level when these are magnified. Um, about a 1% about is the rough, uh, rough guess right now of what the damage will be to global GDP. It's not just about trade. There are all sorts of reasons for Trump trying to improve terms on which US businesses can compete in China and also to restrict what the Chinese are able to do in the United States. There's also important IP issues that don't need me to tell you about those. But this is not just about trade. It's not just about business. It's about much more uh, telling uh, attempts to manage a rising um, confrontation to the point that you now have organizations like the Rand Corporation that are modeling uh, what a conventional war will look like between the United States and China. In some quarters in Washington, you hear that China's rise needs to be stopped aggressively and that the trade tariffs uh, won't do enough and that perhaps this is a moment to think about some form of military engagement that would allow the United States to use its very dramatic military advantage uh, before other competitors become, uh, become uh, more difficult. So this is uh, when, when we start to hear talk of potential wars, uh, you learn that policymakers have not studied their history well enough to understand what might happen next. Um, and when we look at the South China Sea, the contested spaces there as well, it reminds me very much of the contested spaces, the interlocking networks of the, of the past, where powers are trying to provide protection, but also to compete with each other and to offer different kinds of alternatives and possibilities. And of course, the scale of, the, of what we're looking at uh, on the chart behind me shows the level of global trade that passes through um, the Straits of Malacca and the South China Sea. That process has grown in the last 10 years alone from t to just over $2.5 trillion to nearly $3.5 trillion. So any corrections uh, to these kind of trade flows uh, doesn't just have uh, consequences for China and the United States or even Southeast Asia, but they're truly global in their significance. So when we look at the ways in which we try to measure what those dislocations might be, finding economists who are looking at what the costs are of a single week shutdowns of the Malacca Straits or the Lombok Straits, potentials to be rerouting trade around, around, around Australia, this suggests that there's something very dramatic uh, that's going wrong. Uh, historians love things when they go wrong because it's much more exciting when there's drama than when there's uh, stability. People write books about periods when there is dislocation, anger, revolution, and those bits where nothing happens and the stability and prosperity don't get much attention, which is a terrible shame because, like a marriage, the right people to study are the people whose relationships work rather than those who don't. So I think when we look about these maritime worlds, uh, with these new connections that are being made, these ideas about where things might go right and might be going wrong, even yesterday, uh, of the, the reconfiguration of new worlds that involve Africa, involve the Middle East, involve Southeast Asia too, I think I can't help thinking that as climate starts to play a bigger role in the future too, how the states individually, as city-states like, like Singapore that have thrived and had an extraordinary uh, last 50 years, maybe even the last 200 years, maybe even the last 700 years, is that history and time never stand still. But what studying the history of maritime connections shows is that if you're able to adapt, if you're able to work out what's going on, and you're able to position yourself for a changing world, then you reap the benefits, and if you don't, then you suffer the price. Thank you very much.
thank you, Professor Frank Pan. You ended on a somber note as a warning to all of us, but it was a magisterial walk through two and a half millennia of global history. Thank you very much. Now, if I could get you all, if I could invite you to join me in welcoming Professor Peter Boschberg to the podium. Peter, over to you. Yes, uh, after this uh, tour de force by Professor Franco Pan, let me bring you all back to uh, the little red dot known as Singapore. I will be talking about mainly Singapore in the period before 1819, but of course we'll look both at the era before and after that uh, period under review as well. Let me just give you a lowdown as to what I will be talking about. Um, uh, previous. Gone too far. Uh, I will first uh, talk mainly about the 16th to 18th centuries. I will be asking just a series of questions, in fact, four to five of them, and I will start with the big picture and then move inward then to talk about why Singapore declined in the period before 1819. For those of you who are interested in maps, this is a uh, rarely seen original in this part of the world. This is from the now lost miscellany atlas of uh, Manuel Godinho de Heredia from roughly the year 1616 to 22. It uh, was last photographed in the 1950s and its current whereabout is unknown. So here are my four questions that I'm going to be addressing today. The first is, uh, what are the constants that underlie Singapore and the region's history at large before 1819? And we may want to ask whether these are still valid for today. What functions did Singapore and the region serve before 1819? And was Singapore's potential recognized at that point in time in the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries. How did this contest between the different agents play out, and by whom is the area being contested? And what, finally, are the lessons that we can learn from these earlier times and bring in today's perspective? So let me begin now with the first question, which is what are the constants that underlie or characterize Singapore and the region before 1819? Let's first look at some geographic realities here. The most important is, of course, that Singapore is at a dividing point between two major maritime areas. In the west, you have the Greater Bay of Bengal, and the Strait of Malacca was always treated as an extension of the Bay of Bengal geographically, and in the east you have the South China Sea. If you want to transit between these two maritime zones, there really aren't very many options. You can go through the Singapore and Malacca Straits, you can go through the Sunda Strait, or you could go through the Strait of Bali. Now this is in the age of sail. We're talking about before motorized vessels had been invented, before the age of steam navigation. We're informed by the Portuguese sources that anything to the east of the Strait of Bali was very difficult to navigate because at different times of the year, you were either pushed down southward or alternatively you were pushed northward. And I'm going to show you a picture from windy.com in a moment to illustrate this point. As a result of these geographic realities of only having three exit points, and with the Singapore and Malacca Straits arguably being the most significant of these three points, it became contested space. And we don't have to look far back in history to imagine or understand what I'm talking about. We know from the history books that the Singapore and Malacca Straits and the region at large are contested space by a series of historic entities, polities, or empires, if you so wish. Srivijaya, the Cholas from southern India, Siam, Majapahit, 
the Portuguese, the Achenese, Johor, the VOC, that's the Dutch East India Company, later the British. All of these are either trying to exert power and control or projecting their power into the region. And by projection, I mean not just real power, but sometimes it's also a case of wishful thinking or expressing an agenda. We're not always sure how successful they really were in history in exercising a degree of control over the maritime spaces. So Singapore's location is not just one of military strategic importance, but also one of economic significance. That mixture of Mars, war, and Mercury, commerce, uh, going hand in hand. And it really has always been that case. Mercury and Mars going together in this region. Strategic. I understand to mean where a degree of human activity is taking place that is meaningful because you're not in a strategic location militarily or commercially if nobody goes by. I mean, you, know, you would never think, for example, that the Kerguelen Islands in, in the South uh, Indian Ocean would be a strategic location because, frankly, nobody goes by there. So strategic location really has to do with human activity, about commerce. And where there is commerce and money to be made, there is also a degree or a desire to control this. Let me show you what I meant just a moment ago about having only three exit zones. This is taken from the uh, weather site called windy.com. It's a very interesting site if you've never uh, looked at it before. Uh, they visualize wind streams on here, among other things, and you can see that from the eastern part of the Indonesian archipelago, at this time of the year, you are going to be pushed northwards if you're trying to sail through one of the straits uh, east of, let's say, Lombok Island in Indonesia. So it was not viable. And apart from that, it was really a long way out of the way when you came from China and Japan to go via Bali. That was, that was already a huge detour. Was Singapore recognized before, say, 1800? And the answer is yes, absolutely, it was. And you can look at it from a different uh, array of reasons and factors. For example, um, it is remembered in the Malay and Portuguese sources as a former Malay capital. That is known to them. It is known to the Europeans as well because they are picking up and recording what their Malay allies, subjects, and sometimes enemies are telling them. As you can see from this particular map that I have redrawn here, it is envisioned as an island in the middle of the Johor River. And when you read the navigational instructions from the 16th and 17th centuries, you realize that they do imagine or understand the Tebrau or Johor Strait to represent just another branch of the Johor River. And if you imagine the Tebrau Strait in this way, then Singapore becomes a very large island in the middle of an even larger Johor River estuary. And that would make it the classic Malay polity, a port city perched at the end of a riverine system at the sea. This is how we define a classic Malay polity. And it functions almost exactly in this way at that point in time. It is known to have served as a naval base, first of the Malaccan and later of the Johor Empire, and later on also as a gatekeeper to the upstream capitals of Johor, um, Sayong Pinang, uh, Johor Lama, uh, Batu Sawar, uh, Pasiraja, and so on for as long as the capital was in the Johor River, that is. So it was 
an alternative port to Malacca after 1511. It is home initially to the Laksamana, the uh, admiral and uh, a very significant diplomat in the Malay political structure, as well as later of a shabandar or a type of uh, harbor master come, one might say today, asset manager of the royal family, all rolled up in one. 1511, and by the end of the 1500s, we are told by the Flemish gem trader, uh, Jacques de Coutre, in his writings, that Singapore, or Shabandaria, as he calls the port at that point in time, is one of the best that serves the East Indies. So it has a functioning port. There is something going on. There must be trade if you have such an agent stationed there in Singapore. We also can surmise that important things were indeed going on in this period because there are several plans being put forward, at least by the European colonial powers uh, active in the region at the time, to fortify the island. We have, for example, discussions, or what I would call chatter in the letters of Monsoon. These are official pieces of correspondence being exchanged between uh, Goa and Lisbon uh, on the Portuguese side in which they are talking about building a fortification in the Singapore Straits. Various um, sites are being uh, selected and discussed for this, but nothing happens. Another plan, uh, quite a significant one, was put forward by Jacques Aubelar. Uh, Aubelar originally worked for the Dutch. He was the head of operations in Johor between 1609 and 1612. Sometime around that period in 1612, uh, he absconded to the Portuguese side, uh, shows up in Lisbon and spilt the beans on the Dutch. He told them every th the Portuguese authorities everything he knew. And one of the things that he knew was, of course, that the Dutch were planning to build a fortification on what is now the northwestern tip of Sentosa with or without the consent of the local ruler, the Johor Sultan at that point in time. Later uh, fortification proposals come from Jacques de Coutre, this uh, independent uh, merchant who uh, was based in Malacca for about a decade at the turn of the uh, 16th and 17th centuries. Jacques de Coutre uh, made a petition uh, to the King of Spain saying, look, we, we should really fortify the Singapore Straits. We need to control these waters. Uh, we need to keep the Dutch at bay. They're a terrible nuisance and wrecking havoc uh, in our trading world, and this is what we got to do. We have to build a fort where? On the northwestern tip of Sentosa, another one around Bedok or Changi on the east coast of Singapore, and a third smaller one uh, around uh, Pulau Tekong Besar. These were the three structures he proposed. The interesting thing is nothing ever came of these plans, probably because money ran out or they had larger uh, fish to fry, as they say, bigger problems to deal with. In addition to these fortification proposals, we also have Singapore being selected as a point of rendezvous of the Portuguese and Spanish Armadas. Yes, the Singapore also has a Spanish Armada episode. This one takes place in the year 1616. It is anchored, this Armada, off the coast of uh, Changi at the point in time. It consists of uh, 10 very large and heavily armed galleons, several support vessels. Uh, if I recall correctly, there's something like 3,000 men, uh, including a contingent of headhunters from the Philippines and 500 samurai mercenaries from Japan. Uh, they come to Singapore and wait for the Portuguese to arrive from Goa, uh, but the Portuguese don't show up. And when they head up to Malacca to well, seek out what's cooking up there to see what's going on, they then learn that the Portuguese had been completely annihilated, first by the Achenese and uh, finished off by the Dutch uh, just in a few months earlier. And finally, 
Singapore becomes cruising ground for the Dutch in the period 1620 to 1640. This is when they're beginning to step up their efforts to throw the Portuguese out of the city of Malacca. And let me just show you this. Uh, this is uh, based on maritime routes uh, depicted or plotted in the uh, map that you see there by uh, Andre Pereira dos Reis. And I am very pleased to tell you the original is now in Singapore on display on the on paper exhibition in the National Library. So if you want to see it, go have a look at it. Uh, it has uh, color coating here to help visualize these different uh, routes through uh, the islands and the straits. Note the two green large dots. These are what you could call strategic nodal points. This is where the Dutch cruisers uh, are based. And if you look very carefully, you can see that this is also how they control all the waterways, either going between uh, Java and Malacca, as well as coming in from China and Japan in the east. So you control those two spots off the east coast of Singapore and off the northern coast of Karimun, and basically you have everything under wraps in this part of the region. How, therefore, was Singapore's region position understood, and what purposes did it serve? Well, there are two aspects to this. One is functional, and one is geographic. Singapore, uh, as a naval base for Johor and Malacca, it served as gatekeeper of the upstream towns. We already heard this. But it is also an intermediary or intermodular hub. It is at a junction, as it were, of maritime river line and overland traffic. So I'll be showing a map of this from the period in just a moment. And it stands at a point of geographic transition. The Portuguese, even the West Asian, so Arab and Persian sources, and the Chinese sources all look at the Singapore Straits as something of a, a port or a, gate, a portal or a gateway uh, from one maritime zone to another. In fact, the Portuguese routinely speak of the Porta de Singapura, the, the door, the gate of Singapore in terms of the Singapore Straits. And the aforementioned de Coutre speaks of strategic nodal points. These are the ones that the Portuguese specifically are holding in the Indian Ocean region to control or monitor maritime trade. When we carefully read the petitions that de Coutre wrote back uh, to Madrid, we have his, we could reconstruct his ideas about the maritime regions of the Indian Ocean and Western Pacific roughly like this. There are three maritime zones that intersect, and there are a couple of appendages in the west and heading up there into the north as well. When we look at his strategic nodal points, we can see that these are at points of intersection. And lo and behold, this is also where the Portuguese are holding uh, forts and ports uh, for uh, monitoring, controlling, and administering trade in this region. Singapore is one of these key strategic nodal points separating two maritime zones, uh, the Greater Bay of Bengal and the South China Sea. So why did Singapore become such a desirable trophy of war? Well, for one, as we have heard, it is along a key trading route, and it served economic and military functions. There's human activity taking place here, and with this human activity, you have opportunities for revenue, but there's also a potential for contest and war and a need for security. It is at a crucial point of transition. It stands at the convergence of different maritime riverine and overland routes. I will show this in a moment. And Singapore serves as a collection and redistribution center due to its function as gatekeeper and as an intermodular port. We're told by the Portuguese 
and Dutch sources that this region, and Johor in particular, always had a lot of trade, and that the king of Johor made a lot of money, uh, or revenue, from tolls and from trade. And so you may ask, well, what on earth are they trading in? And here's a list of goods that Singapore and the region were known for. Mainly pepper is the main export. Some of it is brought in from Jambi and Indragiri as well. Jungle produce, such as tree resins, precious stones, um, bezoar stones, gold dust from um, Sumatra and even from Borneo, tin, dried fish, pickled fish row, timber, shipbuilding, uh, a type of cane, I can't quite figure out what it's supposed to be, either rattan or bamboo, and minyaktana, um, which is um, a, a unrefined oil that was from the peninsula and from the area in Sumatra around Perlock, uh, filled up in jars and exported uh, for night lights, we were told. This is another map of Arabia from the now lost uh, miscellany atlas. You will see there Singapore on the right-hand side, and it links with the Maritimes, uh, roots. It links with the large or exaggerated riverine Johor system, and there are surprisingly also overland routes, mainly along the east coast of the peninsula, uh, linking into all of this. Uh, the terminal point on the, in the north or on the left-hand side of this map would be Patalung in today's Thailand. When we take this map and some other ones and superimpose it on the Selden map, which is not here yet, but will come uh, soon to Singapore uh, for the uh, on-paper exhibit in a, in a few weeks, when we superimpose the maritime routes on the Selden map from this early 17th century period and the Aradia overland routes, it looks something like this. And this is really stunning because it shows just in what an important area Singapore stood in the bigger picture of maritime and overland trading routes uh, in the early modern period. Why did Singapore decline after the 1600s? Well, this is a complex matter and certainly not due to any single factor. But we can say this, uh, it is largely due to external factors, not factors that are necessarily domestic. First of all, we have a lot of war and convulsion taking place in this part of the world, especially when the Dutch, or after the Dutch, have succeeded in throwing the Portuguese out of Malacca. We have the Jumbi Wars of the late 17th century. We have uh, violence unfolding after the assassination of the Johor Sultan in 1699, uh, with the arrival then of, of the Bugis uh, in uh, Riau. And we have the Dutch also tightening their grip on commerce in this part of the peninsula after around 1682, uh, when uh, Bunton then uh, becomes or is vanquished uh, by the Dutch. Their interest, the Dutch interest in this part of the world is mainly tin and pepper. And the tin was particularly profitable for the Dutch company uh, until its demise in the late 18th century. But Singapore's decline is probably most attributable to its loss as a function as its gatekeeper of the Johor River towns. And this has to do with the move of the capital out of the Johor River region over to the island of Bintan in the early 18th century. It's useful to always think about Singapore as a twin port with Bintan. They, their fates tend to uh, change and interlock with one another. When the one rises, the other one declines and vice versa. And that is true uh, across much of uh, the early modern period and, and even beyond. But what does clearly come through in all of this is that Singapore shows up on the radar screen 
The last time before raffles it showed up on the radar screen was in 1609, when it becomes one of three preferred sites by Abraham Couperus in a memorandum to the Dutch Governor General for constructing a fortification, uh, uh, for, for constructing a new greenfield colony uh, on Singapore when the Napoleonic War should end. So here are some conclusions that we can draw. Uh, the first conclusion we can say is Singapore was always part of something else, really, uh, in this period, first of Malacca, later of Johor, and it serves several functions across time. It's uh, perched along a busy maritime artery and within contested space, commercially and military. It was recognized and appreciated as a strategic nodal point, as a potential military base, and also as a colonial settlement. All of these well before 1819. The key to unlocking Singapore's history in this period is to understand its shifting military and economic functions and how this all fits in to the greater geopolitical uh, calculations of the early European colonial powers and their machinations with the Malay sultanates. And finally, a few words about lessons for today. The underlying constants that I identified at the beginning of my paper are still there. The Singapore and Malacca Straits are and remain the most important maritime artery in this region, connecting the two maritime zones. Past wars, moreover, were about conflicts of regional parties and sometimes the nascent colonial powers before 1819. And that is something that will probably remain the same except that we don't have colonial powers anymore, but there is still a competition, a contest for the control of the straits. Security before 1819 was multipolar, depended on how many major powers reactive in the region. And due to the multipolarity, it was all very fragile. And it may revert to that one day again. And finally, Singapore has played different strategic and economic functions across time. It's a series of different reinventions or reincarnations of a settlement with different functions. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is something we need to think about for the future as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Peter. A riveting story of Singapore's ebb and flow across a vast historical canvas with wars among the great geopolitical powers happening around us and Singapore moving to do the best it could under the different circumstances. Now, as, as people are coming up to the microphones to ask questions, I thought I would observe that our two speakers have certainly delivered on the wealth, war and wealth part of the equation that we had been asked to reflect on. Uh, the first speaker spoke about how Europe long ago was specialized in the production of violence. Its comparative advantage, its unique selling proposition was how it projected that violence into the rest of the world, even as it did that among its own peoples. And then that was how history unfolded. For the second speaker, here too, we saw delivery of the narrative on violence, on war, and the evolution of wealth. Singapore rose and fell as wars occurred around the world. Wars and violence after 1600 led to a relative decline in Singapore. And then at the beginning of the 19th century, 
with the Napoleonic Wars, the handover of Malacca, <coughs> Singapore saw again a resurgence. History is a bloody business. And I'm grateful to see how all of this is laid out for us. But as people are coming up to ask questions, I wonder if I could sneak in a first question to the two speakers. A political philosopher I was reading recently suggested that going forwards, even as we think about violence historically, going forwards, we should not confuse killing and politics. And this advisor was telling his head of state as she prepared to unleash violence on a different part of the world, that that was not how you were going to attract, develop wealth. This advisor, some of you might recognize, as Tyrion Lannister, as he advised Queen Daenerys Targaryen, who held three dragons that were fire-breathing, 10,000 unsullied, freed the slaves of marine as she got ready to unleash destruction on King's Landing in Game of Thrones. Because <laughs> that is not how we want to view going forwards in the world of war and wealth. So I wonder if I could get the two speakers first to reflect on how the story that they've told us about the past carries forwards in a world that ought to view interstate violence now differently. I see people are coming up to the microphones, but I'd like to get the speaker's view on this change in the way we view war and wealth. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think historians should be like, like um, advisors for people who buy and sell shares, and they should have a, be forced by law to have a disclaimer to say past performance is no predictor of the future. <laughs> Um, so it's, I think, difficult, difficult to guess what tomorrow might bring. But I think we forget that, fundamentally, the human condition, that we are, we are animals. You know, we are biologi biologically programmed to compete with each other. And we are protected by law and through human rights protections and so on to, to stop the worst of our ability as human beings to inflict pain and suffering on each other. Um, but that is neither necessarily natural, uh, nor is it always easy. And I think that the, uh, the idea that we have reached a, a promised land where it's entirely logical that war is always bad and that therefore under no circumstances could be considered um, would be, would be um, slightly on, on the optimistic side. So I think that, that even when it comes to future wars, small scale, large scale, whatever it might be, uh, they always seem logical to the people who start them. Uh, you know, in 1914, uh, 100 years ago, uh, in 1939, there was, there was a... There, people had convinced themselves that uh, war would play out in a way that would, they could both predict and would be beneficial. And I suppose the, the sort of the, the more interesting thing is to see what, what benefits war bring, which is a sort of slightly counterintuitive point to make. Funnily enough, wars, despite the fact that they devastate economies, uh, lead, lead to mass deaths, uh, destroy, destroy families and so on, they are specifically good for the people who are worst off in society. So in um, the First World War, for example, in Europe, this was a catalyst to enabling women to get the vote. You know, that was one of the byproducts of the suffering in the trenches across all of Asia uh, and so on. Um, and I think we can forget that uh, the, 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 those who are poorest in society benefit also when there are these dislocations because the correction of wealth, the wealth degradation, the pressures put on states, the big global patterns of, of new opportunities, uh, means that the poorest are, have better negotiating positions. It's the same after global pandemics or large-scale disease. So uh, wars are very bad if you're rich. Uh, they're not great if you're sent to go and fight. But in the long term, uh, wars can be quite good to help some of those social engines that are being pre prevented from happening by, uh, by social hierarchies. The, the challenge at any state, regardless of our political persuasions, presumably is to enable the most able, to, to, to get the most uh, capable in society to rise to the top. 
regardless of their background. Uh, we want the best scientists, doctors, politicians, uh, because we want to be able to identify those who are best able to, to, to deliver. And um, the problem comes when you have protected hierarchies that either the wealth is so great that there's no incentive, or in fact there's a strong disincentive uh, to open um, social, social mobility. And war and disease are quite effective um, ways of resetting the clock. So I, I suspect that there are better ways of having enlightened politicians who can achieve that <laughs> in states than through starting wars. But I think that, that when you hear discussions of saying, uh, whether it's in Game of Thrones or otherwise, that wars can be helpful and that uh, there are, there is a, there's no point taking this option off the table, which is very much a position not just in um, the United States, but also in the, in the recent defense white paper produced in China, that there needs to be scenario planning for all these uh, scenarios. So, um, as we say in Britain, no deal is uh, better than a bad deal. Um, I think that with the concept of, of what violence might mean on a localized uh, basis in the future, uh, there, are, there are some silver linings in it, but there is no, there's absolutely no question that there will be significant war in the future because that's, that's how we're programmed. Thank you. Most interesting. Uh, Professor Boschberg, would you like to weigh in on this? the cleansing effect I, I have, of wars. I have just uh, very little to say about this, actually. Uh, hearing the other Peter talk here, um, I, I um, was reminded of my old school days. And one of the oldest pre-Socratic fragments that I recall having done in my days when I still had to learn ancient Greek in school was uh, war is the father of all things. Um, it's one of these great paradoxes of human existence that human beings have both a very destructive tendency and a destructive nature, but it can also be very creative. And I think that is how we have to look at history as well. And war sometimes is very, well, is often very destructive, but it also afterwards unleashes some of the greatest creativity in human beings. Uh, in the aftermath, and I don't know how many times we've said that we should never go down that path again. I teach European history. They said it after Napoleon. They said it after World War I. They said it after World War II. I, I doubt we're going to succeed in eradicating it, but uh, well, let's, let's hope. The second point I want to make is this. Reading early modern historical sources has taught me one thing. It's easier to win a war than it is to win the peace. Winning the peace is the toughest part of it all. And that is usually where militaries and occupation powers fail abysmally. They can win the war, but they don't win the peace. Thank you very much. Uh, you want to come in? Well, I, I just want to say, so, um, warfare doesn't need to, uh, war, war and wealth, you didn't need to have outbreaks of violence. I mean, the reason I managed to get here um, from Oxford, and I will be able to email my wife later, my children this evening, um, uh, the reason why we can all have GPS that allow us to, uh, to connect with our loved ones and so on, and um, it, it, the fact we can boil our kettles and not have our eggs stick to the pan, is all directly connected in all those cases to the development of military technologies. Mm -hmm. And those technological drivers often have very beneficial byproducts. Some of them have um, a beneficial byproduct that then becomes a, um, a tool of surveillance or of state control and so on. For, for example, our ability to look up things on the internet and see cats falling, off tr falling out of trees, uh, which is the key how the internet started to spread. Uh, so I think that, that we have to be very loose how we think about war. That, that military expenditure this year, will, the United States will spend $750 billion a year on its, on its defense. And um, remember, President Eisenhower in 1955, he said for every dollar spent on a missile, that's one dollar not being spent on a school or on a hospital or on a road. But there are, there are side effects and byproducts. They're very hard to measure, very unpopular to think about how military spending can benefit societies. But there's no question that the things that have accelerated a lot of our global growth and globalization have come directly from the military sphere. Really interesting views from both interlocutors up here. I'm sure we'll come back to these, but I'd like now to come out into the audience. Uh, when you speak, could you speak directly into the microphone? And if you wish, please just identify yourself very, very quickly before you ask your question. Please. Okay. 
Thank you. Um, my name is Lili. Thank you both for your presentation. I wondered if I could ask you to add another layer. Okay. Okay. Yeah, here we go. If I could ask you to add another layer to your, um, to your analysis, and that is the history of addiction. Um, I think we came from a recent conference, and uh, the little bit of lament at the end was that Oops. no one talked about opium and also um, slave trading. So I think my question is one of uh, a place like Singapore uh, having the ability to pick the addiction, uh, and that addiction could happen elsewhere elsewhere, but being the intermediary, uh, you create a lot of wealth. War around opium could happen somewhere else, but uh, it certainly affects. So I think, so in light of, of, of uh, what you're going to say, I am also thinking about the kind of bets that... A okay, your, your microphone's fading in and out, but I think we've got the gist... Yeah, I think... I think we've got the gist of your question. Thank you very much. Could I invite you, Mr. Professor Boschberg, to begin? History of addictions. Well, Singapore is a very significant part of the picture in the commerce of opium in the 19th century. That is absolutely true. Um, how much of it went through Singapore is difficult to say, but uh, we have to assume that quite a bit went through. And, there are other forms of addiction, too, to substance addiction. Um, there are behavioral addictions as well. Um, uh, I really have nothing more to say than that. Yes, why not? Um, why not? Yeah. But certainly in terms of the opium trade, Singapore has a very important role to play in this. Uh, not only in the east-west trade, but also in the regional distribution. If you look at the Riau statistics, for the, even for the early years of the 19th century, you will see that a lot of the opium that was being transacted in the Puerto Riau originally comes from Singapore. Okay, thank you. Professor Frank Pan? Yes. Well, I mean, I suppose that there's a big picture answer to that, which is that um, we always associate stability and prosperity with, with good ethics. You know, there are good ways to make money through free trade. Uh, but, but money, uh, it's, not, it's, it's no coincidence that it's also known as the root of all evil uh, because the temptations to trade and to allow money laundering or to sell uh, drugs and so on uh, that destroy lives, that's a very important part not just of, of Singapore's history but also of China's so-called century of humiliation of the ways in which opium addiction was fostered and deliberately provoked in some cases. So I think that there are, there are uh, contexts for opium slavery that are all to do with uh, the competition or, and, the, uh, and the need to raise money uh, no matter what. I suppose there's a sort of, as, a, as, a, as an aside, and they say history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. One of the key elements of, um, of Donald Trump's efforts to, to renegotiate a different cooperation or different working relationship with China is the prevention of the sale of, of fentanyl from, um, from, uh, from, of opiates from China to the United States and elsewhere. So there's some rich irony, I think, that uh, it's now the Chinese selling opium effectively to other parts of the world, having had it sold towards them uh, for the last 100 years. But ultimately, this is all rooted in education. What do we teach the next generation of teachers, of uh, bus drivers, politicians, leaders, businessmen, and so on, about where they've come from and what their wealth is built on? And I think it's important, absolutely rightly, to be clear and honest about that so that we don't have any illusions and... and talk about pluralism and tolerances that weren't really there because uh, in Singapore, like everywhere else in the world uh, that has been uh, controlled or, or dominated by outside powers, there are terrible prices to pay. So it's great if you're part of the ruling elite, uh, you can talk as much as you like about the, the miracles and the success stories, but if you're at the bottom, which tends to be women, tends to be ethnic minorities, tends to be transient labor, then the conditions are, are sometimes no better than they were 100 years ago. So I think it's important to, to root that in, in education. Excellent. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Zainal here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, I have a question on wealth. I think those who know me will know that I'm peaceful by nature, so I stay away from war. Uh, 
The question <laughs> on sharing of wealth. Uh, I must also thank both professors for bringing us understanding history better and unequivocally debunking the lazy, the sleepy fishing village pre-rifles and by the same token about the myth of the lazy native. So my question is, right now we know that Singapore is so bustling, so dynamic and so successful because of the 75% Chinese that we have in Singapore. Um, because of the drive and the business uh, culture in them. But what was it like pre-Raffles when Singapore, as both of you said, was very bustling too, was very successful too? What was the composition of Singaporeans then like? How cosmopolitan were they? And what br brought about that drive and the bustling Singapore then? Thank you. Thank you. Professor Boschman, I'd like you to take a first stab at that. What Singapore was like pre-Raffles in terms of these factors? Well, we don't have any census or composition of the statistics from this period. We have to assume that they were mostly Malays and Orang Laut. If you wish to separate those two as two ethnic categories, they were at that point in time. We know that there are Chinese businessmen uh, in the Johor capital who uh, were quite wealthy. We know that most of the trading activity was, just like in Malacca before it, firmly in the hands of the royal family. Uh, they are the main agents of trade. Um, the Shabandar basically buys and sells goods uh, on behalf of the ruler, is something like an investment manager, you might call him today. And that the local people were mainly engaged in uh, small retail and in the crafts. We're told that the, they had a very flourishing timber and shipbuilding industry here. But as I also said, there was uh, quite a bit of food preservation taking place as well. So it's very active. We don't know exactly the ethnic composition uh, of these people. In fact, the idea uh, or, or great awareness of race is something that comes in fairly late in the, in the 18th century. Nobody really talks about race in, in, in the 16th or 17th century. You might talk about a language group or you might talk about a tribal group, but they don't talk about race. Uh, and we have to be aware of that. Yeah? When they talk about Malays, they're talking about people who speak Malay, but we don't know what ethnicity they are. That, that's important to bear in mind. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Franco Pan, th this question was specifically about Singapore, and so it might take us a bit away from your original narrative. I'm sure you have interesting observations to make about Singapore and possibly on other parts of the world where similar issues have risen. Well, I think it's, in, particularly in maritime cities around the world, um, you know, they, it's very hard to discriminate against uh, people who come from far away because uh, you, 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 you push your business elsewhere. So there is, there is a usual correlation between uh, prosperity and tolerance and openness. And I suppose no surprise here in, in Singapore in the 19th century, uh, there were bust and still bustling communities from all around the world, of course China, but uh, Armenians, uh, Jews uh, from South Asia and so on. And um, the, the bumpy road is not always uh, smooth, of course, in terms of uh, the relationships that those minorities have with the, with the powers and the authorities. But it makes sense for uh, the authorities to look after the majority in the first instance, but to make sure that it's always reaching out to protect those in, in, from minority backgrounds, whether through religion, ethnicity, language, and so on. And so we find that pattern across, um, across um, uh, the Southeast Asia, actually, where you find rulers who are willing, for example, to adopt Arab dress uh, because there are many tra traders coming from, from the Arabian Gulf and from, from, from the Arabian Peninsula as a way of making them feel welcome and, and open. The challenge is that, that, that tolerance is it's easy to say. It's not necessarily so easy to, um, to enforce, partly because when you have people from different religions but particularly, but also different cultures, uh, their customs are not the same. Their fe religious festivals are not the same. Sometimes the food they eat 
also not the same. Uh, so it means that to, to create the conditions to allow people to want to come and visit, particularly, as I mentioned, in, 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 cities, in cities where you're dictated by the winds, in the pre-steam age, people's uh, time spent in cities here and through South Asia and further east or west would sometimes be very extensive. And so being able to be secure, be able to feel safe and so on, were, were hugely important parts of that story. And so what, I suppose one of, the, one of the interesting things is why is it that states like Japan or Ming Dynasty China uh, shut the door on foreign trade. They don't want their citizens to go and, and leave. And uh, Singapore was one of the beneficiaries of these kinds of policies of people moving from China in search of better opportunities, not just in the 20th century, but going back a long time before that too. Interesting. Uh, please, go ahead. My name is Victoria Burl from the Singapore Management University. I firstly want to thank both speakers for their insightful presentations. I'd love to hear your insights on what China's One Belt, One Road initiative means for Singapore and how Singapore can act as potentially a force for peace amidst rising tensions between this kind of tussle between Western dominance versus Eastern dominance. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Frank Pan, can I invite you to take a first stab at this? Because it takes us back to great power politics and East-West conflict. Well, I'm anxiously looking at the clock because I could, I could talk for a while. Um, I suppose if I was going to be um, uh, step back a little bit, uh, China's Belt and Road Initiative has its own rhythms and there's important discussions to have. In terms of giving a, a decent answer to a question like that, I suppose it's not so very different to Singapore's experience in the 20th century, where the reason for the formation of ASEAN uh, was precisely to stay away from great power competition in Vietnam, in Cambodia, China, etc., uh, and finding a way in which you can prosper when the world around you is demanding that you take sides uh, was a key, key part of the formation of, of, of ASEAN. And so I think that, that uh, China has multiple different explanations and reasons. There are multiple different kinds of uh, Belt and Road, uh, things sitting within the Belt and Road Initiative. There's a, there's a Belt and Road Initiative for oral hygiene, uh, for the polar ice caps, and so on. So there, there's, a, there's an extensive discussion that's required. But in terms of how does Singapore um, manage a rising China whose economy has grown from being worth $1 trillion in 2001 when it joined the WTO to now more than $14 trillion and has clearly has ambitions and expectations elsewhere, and the United States at the same time demanding that... Uh, states take sides. This is a position that's very familiar to Singapore. And it's a situation that's very familiar to this particular region, this particular part of Southeast Asia, because it's the same question that was asked by uh, the Kingdom of Siam and the Khmer and the Srijivaya empires of, of the best thing to do is to be flexible and to understand what's going on in the world and to work out how do you cooperate and collaborate with people who are in a similar position to you. Okay. Um. <clears throat> Professor Boschberg has, has, agreed, has decided that he doesn't want to, to take this on, but he's handed me the responsibility maybe to expand a little bit on the question and to perhaps interrogate you a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> the answer that you gave and the implicit assumption in the, in the question from, the, the, from Singapore Management University is that the Belt Road Initiative is indeed a direct challenge to US-dominated hegemonic control of the international system. On the other hand, there's a view that the BRI is simply a construction of infrastructure. It exports what is expertise, capacity in China in a 21st century version of international trade. Now, unless we are ready to pronounce all attempts to increase international trade as intrusions on the old system, we might not want to be so quick to pronounce that the BRI is, you know, becomes the stage for great power politics, except, of course, one very important great power is interpreting it that way. The question is, should the 80% of the rest of us in the world think of BRI in that same way? Yes, well, that, I think that's the, I was going to say the million dollar question, that's the eight billion, or eight trillion dollar question, depending on how much you believe is going to be committed into the BRA. 
I think a lot, a lot depends on, on what we make of, of China and its, 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 uh, its trajectory. And in the comments made by uh, your Prime Minister of Singapore in the Shangri-La conference uh, earlier this year, I think he put it much better than I ever could, which is that uh, China has had an extraordinary period of growth and it needs to understand that today's China is not the same as the China even of, of 20 years ago. And that means managing expectations, managing a way to negotiate and deal with uh, local interest groups, uh, with the United States, how it take, plays a, a, a leading role on the global stage is something that uh, you don't learn overnight. You know, it takes a long time to understand how to do that. And if one is sympathetic to that process, then one can engage with the dialogue to try to uh, manage uh, these kinds of conversations. You know, as it happens, uh, it seems that some of the, some of the commentaries about the uh, Belt and Road Initiative, uh, which involve you know, building geothermal plants in Bishkek in Kyrgyzstan, don't seem to me enormously either controversial or difficult. Well, clearly when projects go wrong, uh, that's, a, that's, that's bad money lending. And um, anybody who works in finance um, or is an economist knows that if you lend lots of money to lots of bad projects, uh, you, you don't necessarily end up with an optimal outcome. Um, so I think that one needs to step back a little bit from, um, from, from seeing uh, dangers in every single corner. But clearly, this is a part of a bigger story, not just about the Belt and Road. It's about what, what role does China play in the world? And what role do, do established powers, for example, the five permanent members of the United Nations, France, Britain amongst them, um, how do we understand this changing world order? And, you know, quite clearly, uh, the United States which is aggressively uh, talking in ter terms of, of how to counter against the BRI, the obvious way to do that is to invest themselves as an, as an alternative. And here in Singapore, where you've invested in great many infrastructure projects across Southeast Asia and all over parts of the world, uh, Japan likewise, South Korea likewise, there are, there are many other people doing similar things to the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, but I think we, we tend, for whatever reason, to decide to not look at those or put them in the same, um, in the same basket. And that would seem to me uh, intellectually challenging and probably doesn't give us a chance to, to be able to, to understand the, the, the world properly. Excellent, excellent. Now there's a question from over here. Please go ahead, sir. Uh, Mr. Frank Kupan and Mr. Boschberg, uh, thank you so much for your amazing and insightful presentations. Um, Prof, uh, my name is Josh. Um, I'm feeling a little cold here, so if I may, I would like to maximize my time by asking two questions. Go ahead. Prof, um, the first question basically is, uh, Mr. Frank Kupen earlier spoke about the history of the spread of influence to places yet discovered or yet really influenced by, you know, economic flows and things like that. So, are there any lessons or insights that we can draw um, when the spread of influence goes to relatively more pristine areas such as the Arctic Circle or into space. Second question. Uh, Mr. Boschberg, you spoke about geopolitical considerations um, essentially in this region. I, my question is, how do these considerations um, still matter or still play a part in a digital age where there's no restrictions in terms of the flows of things that generate economic flows such as data? Thank you. Thank you very much, Josh. Can I invite... Uh Mr. Boschberg, to begin this discussion. Trade flows are, of course, more than this just digital um, data being transferred. We still have quite a bit of physical goods being stuffed into containers and shipped around the world. And in fact, a big chunk of the world's economy rests today on exploiting what you could call call a comparative advantage, right? You have lower costs or lower uh, emission standards or environmental standards, lower wages, and you produce certain things there, put them into containers, and sell them in, in more affluent places. So geopolitics still plays a role. Um, the flow of shipping and, and, and commerce is still a very important aspect to all of this. Uh, just think of what happens if you would cut off, for example, uh, oil flows through the Straits of Hormuz. Eh? You'd, you'd be in real serious trouble. So physical geopolitics still plays a major role. Um, take, for example, when the, when the, when the pirates were 
uh, wrecking havoc off the coast of Somalia, shipping uh, premiums and insurance premiums were so expensive to go through the you know, Red Sea and the Suez Canal that it was actually cheaper to sail around Africa and extend your voyage by several weeks. So yes, physical distances and physical challenges do still matter very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Frankopan, the question from Josh was about uh, spread of influence into areas previously untouched. And you had talked earlier, of course, about the history of this spread. So the invitation is for you to speculate about how this might look going forward. Well, I, I, suggest, I, I suspect that uh, the outcome is not great. Uh, the the um, track record of uh, spreading into new areas tends to involve uh, climatic and environmental degradation, it tends to involve losses of innocence, it tends to involve the powerful imposing their views and their needs on, on those who are either unable to defend themselves or in fact in the case of the Arctic possibly um, to do with the, with, with the climate altogether. I suppose that the, 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 the sunshine breaking through those clouds is that we are more aware in today's world in the 21st century of the impact of environmental damage and climate change than any of our ancestors. Our ancestors, in fact, were very interested in the concepts of how um, the world was changing, going back even more than 2,000 years. Uh, but I think now the, uh, the, the reality for all of us, wherever we are in the world, of recognizing what climate stress is going to do to our planet um, requires global solutions. So both, in fact, in the areas you mentioned, both to do with the Arctic and space, there are attempts to try to find ways of common language and common agreement between uh, the states, but again, everybody's voice is not equal. Clearly, the, the bigger powers are able to dictate what they, what they want on the terms that they like. So this is a real moment, I think, in, as the wheels turn, Asian economies grow, uh, China's on the move, likewise India and South Asia, Southeast Asia too, population-wise, resource-wise. Uh, there's, there's clearly a, a new demand for a better form of global governance. And uh, the interesting question is that when I was a boy, uh, growing up until I was a, until more or less the middle of the 90s, uh, all the flashbots in the world, the United Nations had a very visible presence, and it's very striking to me in the last two decades how relatively invisible the UN has become. So whether some new format comes for uh, global agreements, uh, some ways in which states and continents that are unrepresented at UN or at multilateral forums, uh, likewise. Uh, one, would, one would hope that the pressures to try to find better ways of cooperating for the big picture of global climate change will have an impact onto the smaller new areas that get opened up, as you mentioned. Excellent. Very optimistic. Thank Ma you, sir. Please. Hello. Uh, my name is Li Ling. I'm from the Singapore University of Social Sciences. Um, my question is, historically, Singapore was the gatekeeper in the Southeast Asian region. In the present days, how could Singapore play its role as a gatekeeper towards the drug war in the region? What are the challenges in its role as a gatekeeper, especially when Thailand has legalized marijuana and Malaysia is considering the legalization of marijuana? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So we're coming back to drugs. <laughs> Uh, now so it's, the, not, it's, the not my, it's not my specialist area. <laughs> not mine either. But both of you have now been tagged with speaking, pronouncing on, on drugs in this region. So perhaps I could begin. Okay, I'll come back. Um, may I just have the interlocutor's answer and then I'll come back to you, sir. Um, okay. Yes, well, you know, diff different states make different decisions. I think it's the, 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 the people and the government of Singapore to decide what is what is right, I, I think that, that um, the key thing is, is obviously to be considering the evidence and deciding whether uh, choices made in other states are ones that you can learn from or whether they're making the wrong decisions. But uh, as, a, as a historian and a so social scientist, I, I'd like decisions to be, be data and evidence driven rather than by what, what we might think is good and what is bad. Very good, excellent. Mr. Boschberg. I'm not quite sure what you mean by gatekeeper. Are you, are you talking about Singapore having a hand in selling all of us like it used to do with opium? Or are you, are you I presume that you're, you, you're intending to say that they should, they should help stop it, is, is your idea. 
that's going to be tricky. Um, you know, it's not the ASEAN way. Uh, to interfere in other people's affairs. So um, <laughs> there's very little that you can probably do about it given the way that sovereignty and especially in, in ASEAN is being, being interpreted. So if, if you say that they should seize on the moment to, to actually make money off of it, um, I don't know. Um, okay. I, I think you might get into some trouble with that at the moment. Um, so really, I don't have much of an answer to it. I don't think Singapore can, can play a big role other than to, to uh, tell the others that they don't think it's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's, let's register that as the answer. We yeah. should tell people that we don't think it's a good idea. Uh, may I turn now to the next question? Sir, please. Thank you very much. My name is Yatiman Yusuf. May I bring back the focus on the pre-1819 Singapore? History has it that uh, in the 14th, 15th, and 16th century, there were a lot of doings and froings from the region itself, whether it involved the Minangkabaus, the Buginis, the Banjaris. But beyond that, we also have the interference from the Khmer and the Champas, and the Siamese in this part of the world. My question is, what were the role played by these uh, indigenous leaders to Singapore? You know, you know, the Minangkabaus came and captured Johor, you know, and then we have the Buginese coming in. There must be some contest involving not just the foreign powers, the Dutch, the Spanish, the, Brit the, the, the English, and the, uh, and the rest, but also the local chieftains. Mm, okay. There must be some roles played by them that affect Singapore during that period. Thank you. Thank you very much. So the role of indigenous leaders here in this region. Well, first Mr. of all, Bushman. I would recommend that you come tomorrow when Leonard and Daya comes and talks, because you might get a better answer from him than you'll get from me. But let me just say this for the time being. Uh, yes, of course, it is very important, these indigenous leaders, these different factions are very important indeed. Um, the Achenese, for example, not known to be very active in the region, actually came and, and overran uh, Johor in the early 17th century. Um, Siak uh, wars in the 17th century, the Bugis diaspora, um, coming here, helping intervene in a domestic fight uh, in the Johor Riau Sultanate, and then as a reward for their, for their role in helping stabilize, if you so wish, the situation then um, become more prominent and assume the role of the Bugis Viceroy in, in Johor Riau. So yes, it's very important indeed. Um, we know, for example, that um, the, uh, if we go by the, the legend of Parameswara, that he came uh, from Java, staged a coup d'etat, uh, killed his host, who was either the son-in-law or otherwise a close relative of the King of Siam, and the King of Siam then sent a, an expeditionary force to, to throw him out of Singapore, and he meanders up to, to Muar and, and subsequently founds or refounds Malacca. So yes, very important indeed. And if you're, if you're a local ruler, um, standing out from the crowd is very important, which is why the Malay Annals, that are amongst the many interesting things with the, the genealogies uh, of the ruling families, is the tracing back to Alexander the Great. Because if you can show that you're connected to something from antiquity and from a long way away, mm. Uh, then you must be more powerful, must be more important than your neighbors. Mm -hmm. Excellent, Alexander. Great. Thank you very much. So, sir. Thank you. My name is Ronan from Catholic Junior College, and I found the concept of learning from our history really quite interesting throughout the whole course of the discussion. But I believe the world we live in today is extremely volatile. We have new issues like climate change and recent protectionism. And for Singapore, we're open to free trade and we're very vulnerable to climate change. So how much faith can we still put into history in correcting and deriving solutions to current day problems? 
Thank you. Okay, thank you. Before we get into this very easy question of how much we trust history going forwards from these two historians, um, I'm going to, because it's coming towards the end of the session, I'm going to get in a second question, and then I'm going to get the two of you to speak to both questions simultaneously. So, Kok Peng, could you please uh, ask your question? Thank you, Danny. You have mentioned my name, so I just describe myself as a peace-loving economist and Singaporean. Um, you know, I think uh, Paul Krugman, uh, sorry, not, I mean uh, Paul Romer, in his uh, last year's uh, Nobel laureate address, made the point that, you know, mankind for most of the history has been wired to look at the world in zero-sum terms. You know, basically, uh, fighting for resources, you know, land, labor, and so on. And in the world that we have been in for a while, but because of the way we are wired, it takes some time to get used to it. And the knowledge economy, more for you doesn't mean less for me. You know, that the marginal cost of knowledge is zero. And I think the more we can think in those terms, uh, maybe there's less to go to war. Because, you know, with the, uh, technological progress, and we are seeing it right now, even as I speak, yeah. uh, there could be more to share. I suppose the second point is, you know, in, the, in this Chinese classical uh, uh, story of three kingdoms, uh, normally the two weak, weaker kingdoms try to get together to take on the one that is stronger, because that is more powerful, and you don't want him to subsume you. Uh, the, the third most powerful kingdom. If you look at the world today, the biggest danger is climate change. I would have thought there's tremendous scope to come together. You know, even if you are suspicious of one another, that is your single biggest danger in the long term. So there's more to be gained on both sides by collaboration to your point uh, about uh, public governance. <coughs> one that is recognized. If you look, project yourself into the future, 50 years from now, if you look back, all this US, China trade wars, etc., is really inconsequential compared to the threat that we are facing. Thank you. Thank you, Kok Peng. So we've got two wonderful questions to end this session with. Uh, Peter Frankopan, may I invite you to begin your, your reaction to this? Uh, well, um, well I, apart from historians, the people I like most in the world, uh, apart from my wife, of course, and my children, are economists. Uh, because uh, the economists don't allow illusions to get in their way. They might have different analysis of data, but it's, it's driven by trying to understand the world in ways that you can't argue with. Um, so that's a sort of, uh, it's, I, I, can, I couldn't agree more both about climate, but also about the, uh, Paul Romer and his, his work. And, and, um, I was with him in, in Central Asia earlier this year. So I'm and, and absolutely right that me getting more doesn't mean less for you. In fact, it's absolutely the opposite way around, uh, as is clear. It would help, I suppose, if some people who were policymakers understood both economics and history. Uh, as far as uh, the, the young gentleman, it's a very good question. What can we learn from history? Well, it all depends which questions you ask. Uh, and uh, each generation asks different questions in different ways and looks to answer them appropriately. Uh, one of the challenges I think we have in the education system is that we teach history as a series of facts, uh, at least until university stage, where suddenly you start to realize that things aren't quite how you imagine, how you see. But it means that everybody who's been through a school system uh, has the same accumulated knowledge of the same assumptions that they think are correct. And then there's a priesthood at the top who get to sit on a stage like this, who tell you why what you think might not be right, which you might be wondering, well, why did you not know that in the first place? Um, so I, I, would, I would encourage uh, the young gentleman to uh, read widely, to be as suspicious of what he reads uh, in the history books as, as, uh, as in the newspapers or anywhere else, but to constantly be asking questions and to not have those questions framed by other people, to be thinking independently about what questions you'd like to try and investigate and where, and, and if they haven't been asked by anybody else, that's in, in itself quite interesting. But I, I think it's exactly right. History can throw up all sorts of uh, parallels. It doesn't show you anything about today's world because it's a different set of circumstances. But the, the universals about growth, prosperity, war, human rights, etc. cetera, there are, there are some fundamental truths in there if you ask the right questions. Thank you. Peter Boschberg. Well, if you've been to the bicentennial experience, you will know that climate change isn't really something new. 
Um, it is new in the sense that we are going into a different phase of climate change, but presumably at some stage, if you read history books, you'll have read of the mini ice age in the late 16th and early 17th century, where the average temperatures were colder than they were now. There have been different impacts of climate change in the past. Uh, I have carefully read some Portuguese sources which intimated that one of the reasons why Malacca was founded is because the winds began to fail um, during the monsoon season and that the ships coming from the Bay of Bengal were only able to go halfway down the coast mm. of Malaya. And so they weren't able to come to Singapore uh, as a result of this. Now, if you look at the time scale for this, this would probably fit in roughly with the beginnings of the change heading into the mini ice age. So there are already consequential uh, historical developments coming out of climate change, and in this one it has to do with the trade route and, and to the very fate of Singapore. And yes, oh, I, I guess I get myself one minute, huh? <laughs> one minute. Um, of course, you know, we can, we can look at the change of the trade routes. We're already now talking about, you know, Arctic shipping. Um, and Singapore even has a seat on the Arctic Council, um, which surprises many. But then again, no, because this is really a major issue if you begin to change the global shipping routes. Now, as for the, the second question of seeing... Um, the world and economics in terms of a zero-sum game, I, I completely agree with that. And we're actually in a very difficult phase right now because automation is going to change the way we look at production. All of our theories of economics have somehow to do with a combination of labor and capital, and this is about to change very profoundly, in my opinion at least. Uh, I don't necessarily agree that we are not going to go to war anymore about resources. I think we're going to go to war or have huge convulsions as a result of two things. If we have rising sea levels, it's going to be about land. And we're already now having sandstorms in places like the Baltic Sea region, which was inconceivable just a few years ago. So we're also going to have huge fights over water resources. And I think we gotta watch that space very carefully because water is gonna be a major bone of contention. Thank you. Thank you. Now, we've reached the end of the session. I hope you will agree with me. This has been an amazing intellectual tour de force from the two interlocutors up here. They've taken us through a romp through 2,500 years of global economic history, 2,500 years of what's happened in this part of the world. We've been on an emotional roller coaster with them through the pessimism of war, but the optimism of flattening power hierarchies, and ultimately, optimism in the future of humanity going forward. So I think there's been a wonderful way to begin the Singapore Bicentennial Conference. It sets up lots of things that we want to be discussing over the rest of this evening and tomorrow. It remains for me only to invite you to join me in thanking our two professors up on stage. <laughs>